Well, we have about 60, 60, 65 percent of children. Um, I don't know how you want to start it. I'm not here to do a formal lecture. Um, I think it's meant to be more Q and A. But Adrian did email me a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to start off by throwing questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, a few questions about treatments and yes. the latest treatments. Correct. Um, you know, I think you guys probably heard about, I'm not going to say treatments, because um, for me as a medical professional, I can only advocate uh, treatments and therapies that have been proven uh, with good evidence to work. Um, and really, if we look at the evidence for um, intervention in autism, it, a lot of, a lot of uh, studies have been done now. But one of the important components of the studies, what it shows is when parents are actively involved in intervention, kids do better in the long run. In terms of their adaptive skills, in terms of their communication abilities, not language, communication abilities, and in terms of emotional uh, emotional response or emotional ability. Okay? And um, you know, I just gave a talk to, to um, pediatricians. We have our yearly updates for child development where we open it up to pediatricians and nurses. So you know, I've just been looking through all the literature. And that seems to be the common theme. There are lots of different new therapies that have come up, and very few of them actually have been shown to have evidence. One thing that does have evidence and it's been shown for a long time is ABA. Okay? Um, but even with ABA, if you look at the studies, it, not all the kids benefit from it. There are some kids who don't benefit from it. But a majority of them, it does help to improve their um, skills, all right? so specific skills that have been taught, and um, it does help to improve their daily living skills, and it does seem to help in terms of their fine motor and communication skills as well. In terms of autism scores, it does seem to reduce it. Now, autism scores are um, mostly looking at the overall social communication, abilities, uh, sensory elements, as well as behavioral things that, that are behavioral problems that we see in autism. So ABA has been shown to improve that. But what it also shows is the milder kids, the kids with higher um, non-verbal cognitive abilities do better than those kids who have slightly more So, you know, I think um, that is something that, that we know about ABA. But it's definitely one of them that has been shown to improve things. Um, one of the questions said to me, do I think uh, ABA works? Well, it works, but it may not work in every child. And what we must remember is, you know, I know a lot of parents are looking for the cure. Yeah. Um, there is no cure. Symptoms improve. What we aim for is that kids are able to function in society. Because if we get rid of autism, we wouldn't have a lot of inventions in this world. Okay? Mm. We wouldn't have musicians who produce fantastic music, okay? You wouldn't have, because people with autism are very much into details, doing things uh, much better than you and me, uh, but maybe they're hyper-focused into one area, okay? So, um, but it's not true for all kids, obviously, and we have to remember that for some of our children, we don't know what areas they are going to shine in, okay? So, ABA works. The question put forward was, do I think ABA is rigid? Um, I'm going to say that it depends on your uh, person leading your therapy, one. It depends on your therapist, per se, and how flexible they are. And it depends on you. How much you generalize the skills that are taught. Very often, I hear parents to me and say, oh, you know, he can do that with the therapist, but he can't do that with me. So then I throw it back to the parents and I say, Is, has he memorized it with the therapist? 
So he's able to do it with that particular item in that particular room. Um, or is it, and so then I would say you need to talk to your therapist about helping you to generalize those skills. Because there's no point you pick up skills that you learn, but you're not able to apply it for, for any a, a simple example is counting. So a lot of parents are very happy and they say to me, I thought he was going to be smart because he could count one to a hundred by the time he was three. Or he could read by the time he was two and a half. But there's no point having those skills if you don't understand what you've learned. Or you're not able to understand if somebody says, give me two apples, you can count to hundred, you can recognize hundred, but you don't understand what two means or three means. So it's very important that, that we remember that whatever skills are picked up, it's applied in life. And, and really, parents have a big role to play in this. I am always keen to advocate um, ABA therapy to parents when I see that um, kids are not progressing, if they've done basic OT speech, or right from the outset if I feel the kid have, lacks a lot of daily living skills um, and I see the parents are struggling to, to work with that. But I have to be realistic that ABA is not good. I think, um, you know, I once sat down and did the calculation myself and with, you know, my salary and my husband's salary, we couldn't afford 10000 if we had a kid with ABA. And hence why I always advocate that parents you know, you need to go and train yourselves as well. And there are some therapists who provide therapy training. Um, and if they don't, then uh, I'm not sure why. Um, but parent training is a very important component of ABA. So if you try ABA for a couple of years and you're finding that your kid's not progressing very well, maybe it's not the right intervention for your child. Okay? I doubt that no child um, I doubt that there's no child who like, doesn't pick up skills from ABA because ABA is actually very good to, to teach kids skills, you know, brushing teeth, to teach them to feed themselves, to teach them some fine motor activities. But maybe ABA doesn't give the child the opportunity to communicate in a natural way. That's my feeling. Saying that, I know of a couple of ABA therapists now who have incorporated more natural play, uh, more sort of... Um, uh, less rigid, sit down at the table type of ABA, and I advocate those type of therapies. And you know, um, I'm not here to plug names, but um, a parent training program like the one that Point Income runs is, I think, a fantastic program. And I've had many parents who really cannot afford um, ABA or they come from outstation, so there's no way they're going to have the therapist come to their homes in. You know, Pahang and Kelantan or Tugadu, but they've come from a parent treatments and it works. And now, Promata Kumia is going out to the States to reach out to, to the lower economic groups for parent treatment. Hence, places like bridges where parents or carers have to be there during your sessions, I think is what we should be advocating for, rather than the model of I farm out the therapy, I go do my own thing, <coughs> and everything is hunky mm. So it, the summary is ABA does work, but maybe not for all kids. Um, and not all kids on the spectrum need ABA. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that, that is very clear to me now. Um, but parents' involvement <laughs> in whatever intervention is doing. Dr. Rajini, uh, just to clarify on that, right? You, when you say that uh, not all parents, uh, I mean, not all ch child, uh, children require ABA, uh, how do you determine uh, if how? they do? Yeah, I know, I know. If they come to see you, it's very easy. The only issue is if they cannot get an appointment to see you. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think, I think, I know sometimes it's, even in my day to day, I mean, I'm wrong sometimes. Um, so sometimes I'm wrong, but sometimes I'm right. Okay, so I'm wrong. So sometimes some people say to me, well, why didn't you immediately refer that child for ABA? And it, you know, I, depends on, on my discussion with parents and um, you know, and we do discuss it when they come to see me. Um, many parents that I've seen are obviously been debating for a while, so a lot of them have done their research before they came. Yeah. But at the beginning, when I first started off and I didn't have waiting lists, um, ABA was foreign to a lot of parents. 
how do I determine that? Mm. So I would always start by getting parents to make changes at home. And, um, you know, a lot of the kids that I have, that I see, always need OT because they are really not engaging. Mm. And yeah, ABA mm. does help in terms of engagement, but I feel that um, OT helps a little bit more. And I think more and more, that's another therapy that's um, finally been, um, how to say, researched in that sensory integration is now being shown to really help children with um, autism and we have evidence for it so we can advocate it even more in the last few years. Mm. So I find that a lot of the kids I see, whether they do ABA or not, they really benefit from OT. So I would normally start with that mm. um, and I see the, and I suggest changes that they make, try a child at play school um, and, and take it from there. And it's, you know, it's not me saying you must do that, it's a two-way thing. Yeah. No, uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Like, the, you, you're saying that OT is a good, okay, is it a phase-off time, okay, as you grow older, okay, do you actually yeah. phase it off? Of course. I mean, therapy is never <coughs> going to be, um, you know, you're like, you're not going to be here forever, right? You have to move on. And it's the same with any therapies you do. You cannot, you will not be doing 30 hours of ABA for 10 years or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I would say there are times where you stop your OT and other things come into play and then you may need to go back to it at a certain point again if a lot of the sensory issues come back. Um, but one thing we have, I do encourage parents to do is, yeah, once the kids get older, um, you need to start looking at sports and sensory activities that you can do with your child. Because you're not going to be doing OT continuously for four years or five years or ten years. So there's no harm in taking breaks. I know therapists will say to you, oh, you shouldn't be taking a break. But we all have holidays from school as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why there are term breaks, you know? We don't forget anything uh, just because we have the end of your holiday. So it's okay to take breaks. I, I don't see, unless you start seeing obvious regression, then you know you've got to go back straight away. But for most kids, um, we don't see that. Okay, uh, I'll just cue in, cue in here. Uh, what about speech therapy? Okay. Yeah. Um, in, you know, speech therapy should come in early. And I'm always conscious that um, all this is going to cost money to, to parents, yeah. right? And a lot of, um, a lot of the good OTs will also work on non-verbal communication. If they didn't, I would definitely advocate that you see a speech therapist. I have to be very honest, we have a lot of junior therapists coming out now from um, um, universities and going straight out to open their own private practice or to join um, centres that have opened up. And I'm always cautious about sending parents to younger therapists because I feel they need to develop their play skills and their communication skills before we can. But with some of the um, kids, <coughs> I do start both speech and OT at the same time, or I say to parents, you start OT first, um, and then you go on to speech maybe a month or two later. And why do I do that? So some speech therapists say to me, you should actually be referring them to us first, and we've had this discussion before. But many of the senior ones will say, actually it helps so much once they've started OT, the kids are a little bit more engaging, and then we can start working on the non-verbal and the verbal communication skills. You know, on the communication skills per se. Where, and, you know, then they can really work on the play and stuff like that. Um, but that's assuming these kids have gone to experience with them. So, in a sense, um, I, in the ideal world, I would want the kid to start ABA, OT, uh, <laughs> speech therapy, and the works. But I know it's not possible from a financial as well as from a time perspective. The other thing I always tell parents is, you know, it's like you, um, okay, you're going to go do a university course, but you do <coughs> law, business, and something else all at once. It's really, you know, it's stress, isn't it? And for the kids, it's stress. So I always say to parents, stagnate. You start with your OT. Never mind you're on a waiting list for the speech therapist. But of course, that waiting list shouldn't be too long. If that waiting list is like four months, that's too long for me. Probably a month or two after OT, it's worth starting the speech therapy. 
For some kids, I actually say, okay, you come back and see me after four months and let's see whether he's more ready. Okay. Because my experience with some of the more experienced speech therapists is sometimes if the kids come too early and if, I mean, I'm not saying parents are all to blame, but some parents don't have the time to work with their kids. It's harder for the therapist to work with them when they are not ready to see. I just want to add on to the speech therapist that you're saying. Because I actually went for two speech therapists for my kids. It's actually not good. So, like what you said, like they are quite new, they are junior, and they actually can handle my child. So, my question is that they actually learn a lot more from YouTube than the speech therapist. So, the main iPad is detrimental to the development. Because I have two camps, say, one say no iPad is bad. Yeah. And I say, can say, iPad is good. But some of the apps okay. is good, right? Okay. So, <coughs> I can reduce my child and it's been progressing. Okay. Generally, screen gadgets are a no-no under two years old. Any screen. TV, iPad, phone, any screen. And parents look at me and say it's impossible. And I say it is possible. I've done it with my kids. Okay, you can do it. Okay. And um, it, it's about, why do we say that? Because there's a lot of research, autism aside, there's a lot of research in typically developing children that it affects language development and it affects attention and um, it affects social integration. Okay? And so that's why we say it's a no-no. Why do we say it's a no-no? Because one, it's one-way communication. When a child sits in front of a screen and there are no adults around, it's just the screen and the child. There's no, there's no two-way communication. Okay? The other thing is it enhances your visual pickup. All right? Um, but what we know is kids stop listening. And a lot of our TV programs nowadays are um, fast moving. So if you look at Sesame Street today, and when I watched Sesame Street in the 70s, it's 27 times faster now than Sesame Street in the late 70s and 80s. Why do you say it's faster? No, it's been heard. Like, you mean in, in terms of pacing or the movement of the characters? Yeah, the movement and the, the what do you call it? The uh, Yeah, the movie. movie. Sesame Street is actually um, not cartoon, right? So it's not, uh, so it's real life characters. But the characters move faster. You just watch Elmo and you watch Ernie and Bert sing a song from the 70s. Big difference. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of programs, even if you watch like Knight Rider and you watch something you could learn now, it's a lot faster now. Okay. Because a lot of people it's more attractive, it's more colorful. So we know it enhances the visual. Now, saying that, it's okay if you sit with your child and watch a program and you know it's like high five and they're doing movements and you say, hey, come on, let's do it together. Then that's an interactive activity. Okay? But of course you're not gonna do that all day long, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if your attention for that program has run out. Stop that TV and walk off to something else that you do together. There are programs now, however, like Gemini. I don't know if any of you know about Gemini. Yeah. Gemini is a program um, which Karen <coughs> produced herself, um, which um, you watch videos of um, people talking. And it's actually helped quite a few kids. And what some of the patients I have have done is they found that the their kids don't respond to those videos, but if they take videos of their sisters or cousins saying sounds, their kid responds to it. And maybe it's through the accent or the But, you know, so what I'm saying is you use it to your advantage. Yeah. Um, but always remember you should be in control of that device, not your child. <coughs> Yes, that's important. That's the important part. A lot of times, it's the child controlling it. Yeah. So I just shut off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I just shut off the Wi-Fi. 
It's wrong that they don't have kids as well. It's just they know how to control the thing. Mm. <coughs> that we have less time with them. And this is where we have to balance it. It's important to go for all the therapies, a week of speech, OT, physio. I think it depends on your child and the difficulties of also that they're having. I'm mean, glad you brought that up because I had a parent who, who I saw yesterday for the first time and um, she wanted me to write a letter to the therapist saying she wants two sessions a week of OT and two sessions a week of speech and I completely disagree because um, I felt that actually this boy needs more time to be with the parent and do more things with the parent and go out to the playground and things like that. So there has to be a balance. Sometimes when they go to the therapy, sometimes they don't do much, they don't pick up much. But then when you do it at home, sometimes it's better. Yeah. So how do you balance it? Okay. So it depends. You're obviously a hands-on mom who does a lot with him. And I can tell you, I have many parents who come from outstation and they cannot come for OT once a week to KL because they're three hours away um, or they cannot afford it. But with those parents, they take away some activities that they can do with their kid at home. And it's not how often you go to therapy, hence ABA a number of hours. There is no proof that 30 or 35 hours is any better than 15 hours. There's no evidence for that. Nobody has come to a conclusion as to how many hours is good. Okay, it's the methodology that works. Okay. So, in that sense, um, what is more important for me, I feel, and what we see is um, when parents pick up skills and do it with their kids, the kid does better. Yeah, but when once they pick up, then you go back to the OT again, they teach you another thing. Yeah. Then you go back and do it, and then it's okay, then they do another thing. Yeah. So it's like non stop. But life is non-stop, right? Mm. <laughs> so it's we all have fun, right? <laughs> so you're feeling the pressure. <laughs> but that's a good sign that, you know, they're picking up skills and, and that comes to another thing. That sometimes you go too fast and your child has an issue with um, uh, retaining information. So you learn something, you go back the next week, you get taught something different, you come back and practice it. And, and that's something you realize, hey, they forgot the previous one. Yeah, and that's to do with um, our kids' working memory. And every child has different levels of working memory, which tells you that you need to keep revisiting some of those things or doing it in different ways. So if you're talking about, I'll give you the example of numbers again. You can count, and you then your child then picks up that, oh, he now knows two apples, five apples. He knows the difference in that number concept. And then you move on and you start teaching him plus and minus. Then you go and you say, oh, can you give me mommy five pieces of Lego and the child will like stop. Uh, but then they can do plus and minus, right? That tells you they are not picking up that skill. They're not understanding that plus and minus. If they don't know what five is, <coughs> don't move on with that. Go back again, reinforce, tell the teacher, okay, yeah, you want me to do this activity, but I think it's just memorizing it. Okay. Mm. I always say this, in terms of academic learning, it will come when the child is ready. You know, um, my youngest daughter, whom I spent the least time with, um, her sisters taught her how to read. And at three and a half, she learned the times table. Okay, up to five. It's like a common issue for my older two kids. I'll come home and say, hey, guess what she learned today? And, you know, <laughs> it, it was like, we had a party trick. <laughs> Let's do times one, two, two times two. She didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay, she could say the times table, and it was something that would show off to the aunties, uncles. We taught her, not mommy. She was a dance <laughs> But then it came, she came to like eight, seven, then the one, then the two. She completely forgot it, and she had to it. But she could understand it this time. Like, oh, why do we do times? It's like you know, two groups of twos is four. So. You know, even in my own, uh, you know, people say, oh, she's super genius. I said, no, it's just a party trick that she does. <laughs> okay? So you, you have kids who go to Kumar and do all the addition. But when you say to them, there's four of us in the room, and one more comes in, they don't understand that. Okay? So you have to make sure your kids understand what they're doing. 
we'll just ask for that in terms of the example classes like Lego, does it help for this child? Okay, I'm not an advocate for classes. If, I mean, I'm just asking okay. uh, this the classes. Con all these concepts help <coughs> children, yeah? But I'm a believer in you can do it with your child, why don't you do it with your child and save money? Mm. I don't know how much it helps or not. But if you, if you say to me, oh, I'm at work, the kids with the maid, nobody's doing anything, I say, okay, now you've got the money, then you send it to a place where the child is interacting with someone, then sitting at home watching the TV because your maid is too busy to play, you know, can't play with your child. Um, I, so I'm not a believer in, in, in classes. Maybe they do help. There's a lot of marketing going on in here, but you have to look at what you are able to do. Some of them do help because you can go, you're not sort of a creative person and your kid goes to read, you may pick up some ideas and use it. Um, but I will be looking more at sports and, you know, those sort of group social activities as being a priority for kids. I, I, I hope nobody's got any franchise. I'm not putting it down, but, um, you know. Yeah. My young father is having sex with his operating disorder. Uh, he's very aggressive towards his brother, especially in meeting. But any outsiders or even in school, he's very shy. If you talk to him, he will put his head down. So, he's a teenager in our center. So he's got sensory integration disorder, but he's also got peer issues. Peer. Yeah. If it's, if it's purely a sensor, I think there was one question about rubbing the elbow. Yes, scratch. scratching. Oh, scratching. rubbing. Yeah, scratching oh. the elbow, right? Yeah. So, you know, having that, that desire with all people, that is definitely a sensory. So, like, you know, touching everybody's elbow, not just the brother's elbow, the sister's elbow. That tells me that this is a primary sensory issue, which is why the kid is doing that. Your son lashing out with his brother or sister, um, it's a. Uh, uh, there are probably issues there between the siblings <coughs> and because maybe he doesn't verbalize. Does he verbalize? Uh, right. yeah. Can he talk? Okay, he, he can talk. Uh, uh, his brother can understand. But uh, it's just that he, he wants to hold everything there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so the issue not there is more the, the relationship issue and the sharing and the yeah. taking. Right? So you've got to be... Um, you're going to be the go-between in terms of trying to build that relationship with them, between them, okay? What's the age difference? Six and eight. Six and eight, okay. Have they always been quite they, No, they, they always play together, but when it comes to, you know, like, uh, even the racket, yeah. the, the, the young the young ones want to grab all the rackets. Okay, so then you need to calculate <coughs> and say, Green yeah, is yours, green is dead. But, but uh, it started to get right. So, like, okay. The, the water is green is uh, the other one. Orange is this one, but so that you can grab the. So that you need to um, enforce and tell the older brother to enforce to say, no, this is mine. Okay? And you have to be firm and consistent about this. I know as parents, sometimes you get tired, you know, just say to the older one, give it to her love. <laughs> Correct? I'm guilty of that too. But the one time you do that, it will always, they will test you and test you and test you. <laughs> so you must have firm boundaries. Sometimes if color coding is not enough, you know, have separate baskets. These are all your things. These are all her things. You know, so you create that physical, um, that, that Obvious thing that okay, this is all mine. <coughs> this is all his. Sorry. No, I have that issue. You I mean, have? yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not yourself. <laughs> 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 you no, know, I'm saying that because my mom used to do that for us when we were young. My sister only had eighteen months old, and um, she says that my sister is she's unsexy. You know, little children always get bullied. Right? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> My mom used to have separate baskets for us to put our different items uh, so that we didn't find and separate cupboards for when we were young so that we don't 
we have corrected this in terms of that. We've got a similar issue, we've got twins. So, um, in fact, you're in there making a lot of noise in the um, Sister is Jack, uh, the son of his one of the pictures. And uh, it's very difficult for him to be able to play without the sister coming in and immediately taking his toy. <laughs> so he will start focusing on something to play with, and she'll come to take it. So he'll move over and move the ball, and she'll come to take the ball. So, so I don't know whether the basket's going to be an option here. Or right. How old are you? Two years later. Yeah, and that you can see at that point having set the basket so we make a difference at all. Mm. Um, it may make a difference at six to you know six and eight years old. Um, I think that's tougher because they're you know the same age yeah. and obviously one knows that she can be more dominant than the other. And this way the adult intervention of redirecting her and enforcing to her that that stays, he's playing with it. It's a common problem for all kids at two and a half. They don't all really understand sharing, turn thinking, you know. Yeah. Well, well, they can be separated in a way for short periods. And yeah. Taking yeah. her into another room and playing with her. Yeah. yeah. And, and even, maybe even, you know, she may have to go to a different play school or even in play school you need to, you know, alert the teachers that this happens so they maybe separate them into different groups. Will this situation include in terms of when they grow older? I mean, they be, okay. I mean, what I do now is I just tell my daughter, okay, which uh, is younger, uh, I just told her that, okay, if you, you play with your stuff and you go okay with his stuff, all right? And then, but somehow, okay, she will still go and grab it, all right? So it's like, you, you, you keep on telling them, okay, but it doesn't get into the heat, okay? So it's <laughs> quite frustrating, I mean. <clears throat> then, if she's old enough, I mean, you know, I, I know it seems unfair, but if both are doing that to each other, just like you have positive rewards, you have negative as well. So you say, okay, you can't share, take it away. Okay. I'm going to wait. Mm. And um, you, you've got to do that. And you've got to enforce that. Tough love, man. Sorry? Tough love, right? Tough love, yeah. <laughs> uh, my son goes to PD, saying, so so what thing the girl <coughs> Girl crying, he cried. The next week, one girl cried. Even the stranger, no. <laughs> no stranger. I think we can't express. Yes. So the teacher went to school. He said, "Do not touch my children." So how do I handle this situation? Every now and then, the teacher complains. Um, he can't control himself. Even at home, he might like you know, he wants something. Really, he don't get it. Like, he cannot be gentle. The telling was he can't be gentle. Yeah, I think you need to explain to the teacher that you know his control of muscles is different. Yeah, yeah. So he may want to like hey, stop, but you know, yeah. yeah. And so maybe you need to teach him uh, uh, an action, like if he cannot he cannot take it, cover your ears or something like that. You may have to simulate it by having crying videos going on and saying to him, you know, so it so cries in your school, cover the ears. Okay, and maybe put it into a social story or something. Um, but you need the school to also be aware that this triggers this reaction in him. So if that girl's crying, somebody has to say to him, uh, remember, okay, you've got to close your ears if it's bothering you. Or the teachers to train him to like sayang. Well, it can be two different. One day he will be crying together with her. Yeah. <laughs> And obviously the noise disturbs it, right? And it's like us. In some days we are in a good mood, we tolerate people's antics, so, you know, we are okay with it. If you could have lack of sleep, you know, we are grumpy as well, right? Uh, yeah. So, and it depends if he's had a happy time in school or it's been a stressful morning, his response is going to be different. But well, the teachers, I think you need to tell them he gets yeah, I see that they say the bullying separately when he goes to yeah. Yeah. Well, at least you train him to cover ears and ask the teachers to help you when you're working on the strategy. I think how they say there's so many of them. Sorry? There's so many of them for them to work to the principal now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Jimmy, sorry. As in Yuan's case, as you know, he nods down most of the time even when he comes to see you. Other days, when I'm in the car or when I'm talking to the nanny, 
He has this thing about us talking together, not including him, and he shouts louder. Oh. Okay. He it, it's like, hello, I'm here, you guys are not talking to me. And we are saying, I'm, I'm telling him that, look, mommy's got to tell Kaka Mary something, because she's just called for a minute and he won't listen. And he keeps shouting louder and louder and louder. So how do I address that, especially when it's in public? So I think it, you may have to try the, I'm going to completely ignore you and mm -hmm. talk louder than you. Oh. And you may need to, so rather than saying to him, because you've tried that, like, hey, I need to talk to Kaka. Mm -hmm. And he's not responded to that. Mm -hmm. So the next step is to ignore. Because we were at your clinic the other day. That's what he did. I can't be talking louder because there are so many other people in there. Okay. I can't be talking louder to it in public. Okay. So then if, if that's the case, one you ignore, mm -hmm. okay, and you don't acknowledge positively or negatively that he's interrupting your conversation. Mm -hmm. um, two, so then you may need to, if it's in public, you may need to have your mom come by and just near each other, okay, while he carries on his antiques. You better ignore public. While you're doing this behavioral strategy, um, it's like the skinny child who wants his chocolate or sweet from the aunt, right? You're going to leave them there crying because you know, the old people will come and say, I'm your child. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> if they're not consistent with that, so the child learns, I'm not going to get it, so I'm just not going to do this behavior yeah. twice around. Um, the other thing is, you give him a signal that, you know, you don't say anything, <coughs> you just turn him away. Mm. Okay? And just say, I'm not happy, turn him away, and that's the end of May I know why he's doing that? He's, he's upset, he wants to be part of it. I mean, he feels that he needs to be included in everything. Right? Uh -huh. You often say, before they, you, you look and see what triggers the tantrum. If you can figure out a trigger, you change that trigger. <clears throat> Just like for example in the class there are seven activities you want to avoid one particular one, you know. Uh, so if, if you continue to push him to go into the activity, then he will start to stand wrong. So should we just let him skip and go to the next one? Because it's not particularly to say that activity he will he will avoid it. He just sometimes he will participate, sometimes he does do not participate. Whatever strategy you want to take, you have to be consistent. So, meaning if today you avoid it, then every week you avoid it. But if you say today he's not crying, I will do the activity. <coughs> Next week he's crying, I won't do the activity. He will soon learn that by crying, mommy will let me avoid it. Or mommy and daddy will let me avoid it. So, you either say for a while we just don't do the activity. After maybe a month you come back to the activity. Or you say, and you need to just decide this with whoever's with you. Uh, we're going to just push through and just make it as part of the routine. Obviously, if you're in a class where you know every child has to go through a particular activity, and you know, and if you're all pretty much similar in terms of your abilities or whatever, then teachers may not be happy about you avoiding that activity. Then maybe you need to talk to him beforehand. <coughs> Have a social story, say first we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this. And social stories work very well actually. You know? And I really encourage parents, a lot of our kids are visual and they work with these teachers. And you can say, you know, first we're gonna do this, do this, do this, do this. And at the end of it, he gets a reward or whatever. <coughs> so then you actually practice that with him every time. So whether he cries through the activity or not, but you've been through that station. How do we stop him from uh, going into a certain center? Uh, how do we stop him to run? Once I drop him, he will run. Very easy to move. I'm sorry, I hate shopping centers. <laughs> 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 so if I have to go to shopping centers, because I think I have a sensory issue and I just, uh, I hate window shopping. <laughs> I hate shopping. If my kids and I have to buy stuff for school, mm -hmm. we go like 8 o'clock at night mm -hmm. to make a mall, we get the uniform, we get the shoes, we have yeah, people that stop shopping then or they're 18, right? Yeah. And I choose it. Or I say to them, I'm on leave today, we're going early in the morning, 10 o'clock, we're out there by 11. Yeah, I have been doing that, I feel that I'm 
So shall, sometimes actually we go out there without bringing him because we might come the sun. So I feel so sorry about that. So Okay, I would say, you know, I think, I, I really, I'm serious about the shopping centre. I think it's a real sensory stimulating place. Mm-hmm. I mean, give me a chance, I'll go for him any day. Like, it's <laughs> far. But I start the day by going outdoors. It really makes a difference. Yeah. We go for a morning walk, see some greener, run around the playground. It really makes a difference to a child's life. So I would try that before you go shopping. You go to the playground, let him run around, burn up some energy, then you go to the shopping. I think also because shopping centers also uh, they have very noisy, bright, and uh, so it's, it, it, it it could be a sensory overload for yes. some of the kids. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think as I've got older, it's worse because like like I've got relatives in Singapore, so sometimes we go there to see the Christmas lights, right? and yeah, the kids love it, but I, I always get <laughs> <laughs> so especially now my kids are older. I say to them, well, can you walk to there? <laughs> Just wait in this corner and come back. So, actually, the Christmas is so nice, and I'm going to be just a little. But I found I want to run here and then I'm so sorry. I don't feel this nice. Sometimes it feels. I think it's really a sensory overload for some kids. Do you think that if a situation like this is any way that whereby you have a sensory overload, okay? Why don't you just start them from young, okay? Bring them to places like that, okay? Or, or let them see all kind of lights, okay? Will they get immune later? <laughs> no, I don't, you know, I don't see that. Depends. <laughs> I don't know, it depends what you see as a priority. I really don't see that shopping centers offer much um, stimulation for children. Yes. Because even if they run, it's only a restricted space that they run. So, uh, I think it's mm-hmm. too much hazards. Yeah, maybe I think so too. The, the leaves, the escalator, yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. So, but you know, if there are situations, okay, alright, like like noisy restaurants and you have to go to them, if you have to go to them for whatever reason. So I have a family, the family run a restaurant and the kid is in there. But, you know, he hates it. So they used to like lock him up in the room. Um, when he was younger, obviously they can't do that anymore. So we do need to try to, you know, desensitize to some extent. But um, yeah, it depends on the situation. That's then I would say this would for my kid. If we buy when he was young, yeah. we need the old kind of places. Okay, we got this weather. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not talking about shopping malls. <laughs> back to this issue that you know a lot of parents keep their kids at home because it's easier, not you know, less stressful for the kid and for the child. But by restricting the environments that you expose your child to, you are actually creating more harm than good. So, you know, I always say this, if you want to say get your child used to being in an environment, you tell yourself, so you say like shopping centre, okay? Um, you want him to get used to shopping centers, okay, fine. I accept that some parents have to go every weekend and do their grocery or whatever. So then you choose a time that is quiet, less noisy, and you go in, alright? Or you tell yourself, I'm going to practice this, so I'm only going to go in for half an hour and then come home. Then you stretch the time, stretch the time, etc. Right. But definitely exposure. Sorry, um, I rarely take my son out except for grocery shopping that is really stressful and he loves it. Otherwise, I used to take him to the playground where he would love seeing all the other kids play. But it's been some time now since he went, for more than a year, because I think he has this um, inferior complex because he sees these kids playing football and he's not walking, he's not running, he sits there and he used to love to swing. Now he doesn't even want to swing because he can't fit into the um, kiddies swing anymore and he doesn't want to go anymore. But I would love that he goes to a playground just to enjoy the environment and eating air but he doesn't seem to. So how do I do this? I guess you need to take him at a time that's quiet. So like mornings when kids usually are sleeping and he's sleeping. Because he has sleep disorders as you know and he wakes up really really late. If that's a situation, try find playgrounds that are not, you know, uh, 
being secretive or maybe it's the time that you can. But I think it's so important that he's exposed to but wouldn't it be good for me to take him out when there are people so that it's like an interaction sort of thing? It is, but if you're saying it's creating anxiety, yeah. to make him like that environment, first you do it when you're less people. Okay. Then you slowly introduce him, you know, what it's like before. Mm. He used to love it and then somehow, I don't know, probably he feels that he's not running around playing football. He used to enjoy watching them and clapping hands and dancing away. Then of late, whenever we pass, I say, what, do you want to go down? Do you want to go down? He refuses to go down right now. And he keeps looking at all these kids playing and he doesn't want to even look at anymore. So, continue, but... Uh, yeah, choose a time that's less okay. um, Normally, I used to pick my son at the lobby. I used to have a Now, I don't have a So, I have to drag him to the car park. Every time going to classes, it's a nightmare. He'll throw himself at home. I have to like scold him and drag him and throw himself on the floor and there's like a lot of people looking at him and drag him, drag him, drag him, drag him, drag him. but then sometimes it's like you know this hand also will have scars and pulling and all that then going inside the car and all okay once he reach the therapy home oh, he's fine <laughs> having super fine when give me a hard time coming out and then after that go back again then I used to bribe him bribe him five times or six times before when he comes to the father we always talk about positive behavior modeling, right? So showing your kids the good behaviors to be used. Sometimes we're doing them crying and then um, we're doing them when they're good and showing them, hey, this is, and then we like, can share with the therapist, like, hey, you see, this is Ethan when he goes with daddy, good behavior, right? But sometimes he cries. So, you know, then maybe you can negotiate with the therapist. I think he understands.
before you remove the old food. Okay, because by doing a cold turkey where you just suddenly change diet, some children react behaviorally, either because they're hungry, their blood sugar is low, or because they're angry, they don't like what they're eating. So it has to be a gradual process. So even when you're changing milk, for example, you do like a quarter of the new milk with three quarters of the old milk, and you gradually change the proportion. But you've got to make sure that you are giving your child a well-balanced diet. And don't listen to what my friend is doing. Do your own research. And if you're really unsure, go and see a dietitian once to say, I want to do this diet. How do I get ideas of it? And I tell you, you've got to be a good girl. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the parents who succeed in the diet, um, maintaining the diet, they do it themselves. Because, you know, you try and taste the gluten-free bread that's mm. out there. It's hard and it's really sweet. But I have tasted some really nice gluten-free bread that um, parents make, okay? And they chop and change things. It's never like the normal bread or normal cakes, but you know, it is palatable if you do it yourself. So the jury is out on that. Sorry, uh, because I actually get a lot of questions all the time from parents who just discovered uh, their child is autistic, right? So the, the first thing I always want to do is, what should you do first? Because they are panicking already, so they, are, they, are, they have a lot of friends and relatives telling them, you know, you should do this, you should do that, you know, you should go see this sensei, you should go see that uh, Bomo, or else, or, or else, or else, or else, you have these uh, supplements they want to introduce, or biomedical uh, devices, uh, neurofeedback and stuff like that. I mean, What's your take on all that? I mean, they are panicking really. I mean, they just want to know what to do. They want to do everything, but they can't do everything, of course. So they need to pick and choose. I mean, you know. And I would say start off with something simple like going to see a, a speech therapist because the speech therapists are all very well versed on interventions and autism and they will probably say to you, okay, go start OT, okay, um, and then come back and see you or something like that. Um, I think talk to parents who have kids, you know, um, who have themselves. Um, obviously, parents will always try and find the, the best choice one, but parents are all, you know, you want to do something quick, isn't it? When you're panicking, you want immediate changes. And I see a lot of parents, the first thing they do is go on the diet, okay? I don't stop them. You know why? Because I find when they're starting to do the diet, they're starting to be aware of what their children do. I find that. Um, previously, the kid is on milk five times a day and not eating vegetables, not eating meat, eating plain rice. As soon as they go on the diet, they really work hard and get the kids to eat. So I don't stop parents. Yeah, okay. I mean, I changed my diet from being a meat to a vegetarian. So I know what it's like. So you start really looking at what you eat to make sure you get enough protein, etc. But um, it is not a proven therapy. And I think parents need to know about that. And I think for you guys who've already had kids, I think you know that. You change diets, you see maybe their sleep improves. Maybe they are um, less hyper or, you know, things like that. And, but you know this is not the thing that has really made the difference in your child's life. And you can, I know the proponents of BioMed make it sound like this is the cure therapy. But I say this, if it's really such a wonderful therapy, why are we having waiting lists of people still, you know, need to be diagnosed? You just go to the biomed therapy and we just won't have a waiting list. I won't have a waiting list. Because the kids will be fine. You just go to the diet and it's all sorted. Yeah. But it's not. And you know that for a fact. So yeah, you can try the change in diet, but you need to be doing intervention. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, it isn't probably as accessible as a first-line intervention. But speech therapists are. No matter in which state you are, there will be a speech therapist somewhere. Like how quickly you get to see the person is different. Ah, uh, to to uh, go on further on that, right? Uh, there is actually a lot of new therapies right right now that is going on. I uh, have just been. Ask about something new called neurofeedback, yeah. which is basically a reverse EEG. Yes. 
to your brain. Yeah. So because instead of reading the EEG, they, they push it back to you, alpha waves and stuff like that. Yeah. So again, they are asking, is it, is it any validity? Because it's not cheap. Yeah. It's never cheap. Yeah. It's never cheap. And then uh, stuff like that, like neural feedback. Uh, there's also the mercury chelation yes. therapy. Uh, what other things? Uh, there's, there's a lot actually. Yeah. There's even one that they inject. Uh, they actually inject. Uh, I think chlorine dioxide up the anus or drip into. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. There, there's this, this kind of new therapy. So, so they, all, all the parents want to know because they've been hearing all these things from the internet, getting from the internet, right? So there's no clarity uh, because on the internet everything is uh, assumed to be on the same level. Whether it comes from a specialist or come from just a parent. So, of course, they want to know whether they sh should they start on that. So, you know, and stuff but like that. My first thing is to say no. Okay? You want to dabble, and then once your kids have made progress with the other interventions, that's fine. And parents are always saying, I and asking me this question. Um, neurofeedback uh, came about because they detected that brain waves of people with different developmental disorders are different. And we know that. That's not surprising to us because we know there's a neurological basis to this condition. It's not because of poor parenting that this child has autism or ADHD or whatever. Their brains are wired differently. How they respond to, to environment is also different. But um, the, the studies that were done on neurofeedback initially were on, on young adults and adults with ADHD. And they showed some improvement, some, not statistically, improvement in their attention. Suddenly, kids are being exposed to neurofeedback, kids as young as three years old. So, you know, we don't know that it's, it's a proven therapy. Um, I haven't seen remarkable changes in any of the kids who go for it. Um, and, yeah, it's the same with Biomed. Yeah. You may read stories about the medical cure, but who knows, these kids might have improved even without the biomed. Did you do biomed, David? No, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, because actually there's a, there's a, a yeah, no, because there's a, a, a not say epidemic, I would say that I think in Australia or, or Wales, they are, I think they are they ca coming out with a new law against, uh, you know, dripping chlorine dioxide, especially chlorine dioxide, right? They have been injecting up the anus and then asking them to drink the chlorine dioxide and stuff like that because it, I think, it, it, I don't know, it kills some kind of parasite or something like that, they believe. So these are all the therapies that, are, I mean, a lot of parents are hearing about yeah. and they are desperate to try. And to them, chlorine dioxide is cheap. <laughs> I guess, I think, I, you know. But, no, because there's a lot of testimony that my child is cured of, di of autism, you see. So I don't, why should I go to, to therapy where it's so hard? I have to sit down and learn with the, with the child. I have to come back and repeat it every single day. I mean, it's hours and hours, you know. I spend hours and hours with my child. So I know how, how much effort it takes. So a lot of new parents, they come in, they see the amount of effort they need to put into to the child versus, well, just a couple of drops, you know, a day, you know. And just, I just give it an email once or twice a day. Uh, and stuff like that, you know. I mean, it, it is a simpler solution, I guess, you know, for all of them until I guess it's, it's too late, you know. I'm just, I'm just wondering because a lot of parents are asking me, okay. right? So I need to. My, my yeah. take is always if the, these things are really a cure, we wouldn't be having still so many kids needing intervention. They wouldn't be waiting this for intervention. The, and also in America, that's true. Really, yeah. But, oh yeah, there's another question about that actually uh, regarding parents, especially new parents, always the new parents always ask because the minute they, they discover their, their diagnosis, right, first thing they do is go to the internet, right, and the first thing they find out is you should always stop vaccines, not only for the child but also for the brothers and sisters and stuff like that. So again, I mean, we, I think we need to clarify on that because uh, I mean on the internet everything is, is perceived to be the same level. Nobody actually checks the background of the person giving the advice. So as long as the internet is true, they always believe, you know. So I mean, we need, if it's possible for you to clarify whether, you know, yeah. on. Yeah, you know, I, this vaccine thing has been around for a long time. And I understand parents getting worried. And the initial study, I really disputed. The guy was struck off, I think it was in America somewhere, but um, it was disputed. From my own clinical practice, I can say to you, I, in my years of following up families with autism, there are siblings who have not been vaccinated who still develop autism. Okay? 
So there's definitely a genetic element in that. I understand parents' anxieties. Why and, and why they think it's related. If we look at children with autism, and a lot of research is now coming out looking at infant's behavior. Okay? At two months old, children, babies with autism are the same as all other babies. They have good eye contact and things like that. But when they look at them, say at nine months old, you can already see there's a drop in their eye contact and their interaction. It's not as sustained. But this is only in about half of children who later on go on to get diagnosed. Another half continue to develop normally, and then around about 18 months or so, they seem to regress. Okay, either they regress or they stagnate. Okay, or they never pick up the communication and the interaction skills. So, um, and what they also have found is when they look back on home videos of children who were diagnosed at three, half of them can be you can tell when they were babies that. And I, I see that a lot in, in my practice now. I, I say to parents that it is a bit of a, not to say a coincidence, the timing of the MMR is that you give it around about 15 months to 18 months. But that's around the time where you start to notice that kids with autism also have these um, uh, difficulties. Okay? So to blame it on the MMR, I, we don't have enough evidence for that. There are studies going on in the US looking at to see whether some children with autism react differently to uh, immunizations. And maybe there's a small group, but it doesn't account for the, the bigger picture. Okay? Um, so, you know, I think increasingly we are seeing cases of measles, children dying. Um, my uh, neighbor's helper, okay, my neighbor's helper was telling me she comes from our and she comes in every day and she got worried because her kids had chicken pox, so she wanted advice from me. And then she said in the nearby nursery, two kids had measles and died, they were babies. Okay. We shouldn't have cases of measles dying. And when I worked at UKM, um, the orphanage next door to the hospital, Back in 2007, 2008, there was a huge outbreak of measles in the village. And in a space of three months, we lost 10 or 11 babies. Okay. These are orphans. Many of them are probably abandoned babies. But we lost 10, and it scarred a lot of my junior doctors and for myself. I didn't see people, babies die. Never came out in the press. Why? Because these are all abandoned babies and people who don't matter to society. But we are seeing an upsurge of measles now in the UK. One thing we do know is, although the percentage is very low, something like 0.1% or 0.01% of children with measles, the virus lies dormant. And we suggest eight or nine years later to give you a degenerative disease where it slowly eats away at your brain and you die in your teenage years. So we're going to see an upsurge of that. I think maybe we, uh, it's, it's getting a bit late, so maybe we end on a slightly more promising note because a lot, again, I, I'm trying to do this for all the new parents because they always come and ask me, right? So they want to know, because they see, they see Ryan, they Ryan has improved quite a fair bit, okay? But to them, it's, it could be an exceptional case. So they want to know in your experience as, you know, uh, is it, uh, does it really help to do all this therapy? I mean, what is the percentage, what's the chances of the child you know, improving to the same level, I mean, or, or something like that, you know? All right. Every child's different. Yes. And, um, of course, Ryan was diagnosed early, and some of you have had kids who were diagnosed early. When I, for me, early is not three. Early is not three. It's below two. That's early. And um, I, I have to give credit to both of you because you guys work really hard with Ryan. Okay? And I see that a lot. But I also see cases where the kids are diagnosed early, the parents put in a lot of effort, but I sort of know the kids are not going to do so well because they have a lot more developmental delay with the autism as well. Okay? And every child is different. But you don't, I don't 
use benchmarks of being able to go to a normal school as being a success story. I see that this child has developed communication skills, is part of you know, functioning in a group of kids, pretty okay. Yeah, they may have their quirkiness and their social isolation, but they still can function in society and they can keep up with peers to a certain extent. Even though their speech is still delayed, even though their handwriting is lousy, even though they are slow with learning to read, it doesn't matter. Okay. Early intervention really works. Okay? And I'm a proponent of that. And you know, and hence why I prioritize young kids in my clinic. If you're under two, I'll try and see you as soon as possible. Okay? Because I know it works. But what helps is if the parents are on board with the kids. This is like a bank investment, you know. Mm. It's about um, putting in the money early, little by little, but allowing it to grow over time, rather than you wait till they are five and then suddenly you throw in fifty thousand. <laughs> Not going to guarantee and as parents, there are sacrifices we have to make. Very much so. And maybe we don't reap those benefits of those successes then, but it comes later. <coughs> and and you know that that is something that I want to impart to parents. Okay. And I think parents support parents. Doctors are the least, I always tell parents, I'm the least important person in your life. You don't need to see me. You see me when you're in trouble. Yeah. I'm here <laughs> as a guide, it's okay. Right? And I'm here just as a guide. I'm not here to be in your lives forever. Okay? It's the same with teachers. It's the same with therapists. You are the permanence in their lives. So it's whatever you do, it kind of back. I wasn't going to be a developmental pediatrician. I was going to be a famous pediatric neurologist <laughs> with a PhD, and then suddenly I got pregnant. And uh, then I, had, I was in four months maternity leave. I'll go back to work. <laughs> took one year off, and then I changed my career path. And my parents said, "Ah, you will have no job when you come back to Malaysia." And nobody wanted me when I came back. But then I found my path in life. You know, and I was so despondent. And and then I realized, wow, okay, life really has a reason. For the sacrifices that we made early on, my husband and I, we see the benefits. People say, why well, you came back here with the current economic situation, right? The current politics. But I say, my kids have benefited. They may not be in the UK, but they have learned lessons in life of being with their grandparents. And also, that mm. you are so important in their lives. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't get the best therapist in town. And never underestimate what you do. And if you make a decision to do something with your child, don't ever regret it. There may be a reason why you had to try that. Hmm. To show to yourself, oh, it doesn't work for my son, I move on to something else. And don't compare Ryan with another child. They each have their strengths and right. weaknesses. Yeah. And I think hope and never give up. Yes, very important. Okay. We start over and over and over again all the time. Sorry? We start over and over and over all yeah, the time. Yeah, and you know, life's like that, isn't it? You have your ups and your downs. Things that like movie, parent, parenting, parents yeah. with yeah. parenting is a yeah. little coaster. That's right. Then last question. Can I answer all the questions? Yeah, so no, no, no other questions, right? I mean, is that, is that all? I mean, I uh, hope uh, Dr. Rajin has answered uh, all the questions because it's all, uh, almost one and a half hours. Is it one and a half hours? Yeah, about that. <laughs> okay, so there's nothing, right? Oh, there you go.